Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Wolfer. I'm the Acting Wildlife Division Administrator for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and you're joining us here tonight to talk about our mule deer management plan revision process. As you probably know, mule deer have been in decline, um, long-term decline across most of their range, and Oregon has experienced this decline uh, along with many other states. We want to turn this trend around and we want to invest in our mule deer and improve our mule deer populations. We've put up a lot of effort in the mule deer. Um, starting back in 2010, uh, we started working on the mule deer initiative, which was selecting a few units to, to invest resources in to try to improve things for mule deer. In 2014, we started one of the biggest collaring efforts on mule deer that's, that's ever been undertaken. And that effort was really geared towards getting the information we needed to revise our mule deer management plan so that we could uh, effectively manage mule deer. <clears throat> We've also made some investments in increasing our staff capacity. Um, Dr. Don Whitaker, who you're going to hear from this evening, is our ungulate coordinator. With all this work that we've been doing on mule deer, all this uh, collaring effort um, and all the data coming in, we also uh, hired a mule deer coordinator, and that's Josh Smith. So Josh was previously working in our research unit over in La Grande, working on mule deer research, Rocky Mountain elk research, among other things. And so now he's uh, helping increase our capacity as we put effort into writing this plan, uh, as well as managing our mule deer. So with that, um, I really want to encourage you to stay engaged. We've, we've released three draft chapters so far, um, and we've posted up our mule deer tech report. These chapters are truly draft. Um, we, we encourage people to review those chapters, provide feedback to us. Uh, that feedback will be used to modify uh, the chapters that, for, the, for the final mule deer plan. Um, we're also going to be drafting chapters throughout the rest of this spring, summer, and into the fall and releasing those on our webpage. So watch our webpage, uh, get signed up for updates so that you get an email every time we have an update, um, and, and stay engaged because we really do want to hear from you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Don Whitaker. Thanks, Brian. Can I assume everybody sees the title slide here? Yes, it looks good, Don. Am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, as Brian just pointed out, um, your comments and your feedback is very, very important to this whole process. Um, we are asking that everybody submit any comments, questions, or concerns in advance using the form that is currently on our website. Um, at the end of this webinar, we will address a few of the comments that we've received to date. Um, and just so everybody's aware, we are recording this webinar. Um, that way you can come back and revisit it if you need to. You can share that link with other folks that may not have been able to attend this evening so they can see it as well. So the overarching goal for this rewrite of our mule deer plan is to update this plan completely using the best science and current information, both locally and from around the region and mule deer, so that it informs Oregon's mule deer management within the current capacity of our landscape in a way that optimizes opportunities for Oregon citizens. Underneath this goal are six primary objectives. Basically, we want to use the newly defined herd ranges as the basis for how we manage mule deer across their range in eastern Oregon. We want to inform our management decisions of mule deer using the most rigorous and modern scientific methods for monitoring our populations and monitoring our harvest. We want to maintain and enhance our mule deer habitats as we started 10 year, or in 2010 with the Mule Deer Initiative. We're going to continue our efforts to improve the overall conditions of habitats on winter and summer ranges for our mule deer. Again, we need to balance those populations with the landscape that's available for them, but we also want to incorporate the tolerance levels of landowners and the attitudes of everybody involved with mule deer, including our consumptive hunters and our non-consumptive viewers and photographers as well. We're going to manage our harvest 
of Mirbe within a biologically sound level, incorporating all of those values so that we can provide for an optimum consumptive and non-consumptive recreational uses of this important wildlife resource for the state of Oregon. So our goal this evening is to go through the management plan and tonight's webinar we are, we're going to go through the goals and objectives like we already have. We're going to talk briefly about the plan revision process because it's a bit of a new process for all of us. We'll briefly talk about the Oregon's mule deer history and the herd ranges as we've got them defined now and then we'll finish it with a discussion of mule deer biology and ecology and some significant concepts there. And then the last closing stuff will be our next steps and an opportunity to try and address a few of the comments that we might have received so far. So the plan revision process, let's talk about that. We started this over a year ago. We started with some internal scoping to help us get on the trail looking at, okay, how do we want to do it? What are the main concepts and topics that we want to talk about? We ran those out and, and reviewed those through the sport leaders group that we periodically hold meetings with. And then in January, we, really, we released our herd inch technical report to kind of let everybody know where the cornerstones are of our new management directions are going to be. We started releasing the sections one at a time as we get them completed in a draft form for everybody to look at. Um, this started in January and will continue until we get through all of our sections, hopefully by October or so. Our hope is that this, this provides everybody more time to review these in detail and think about what we're trying to do. And we're going to have more webinars, likely in June and in August and October, as these sections come available and we get comments and suggestions from all of you. Our overall hope is that we can have a a combined wrap of all the sections incorporating as much of the comments in sections or addressing those comments in sections by late fall of 2023 with a tentative adoption sometime early in 2024. As Brian mentioned, and, and um, as we all know, our new have been in long-term decline since about the 1980s. But when the state was being settled in the early 1800s through the 1930s, they didn't find many mule deer when they got here. Uh, beginning in the 40s, when management authority was given to the Oregon State Game Commission at the time, and through the late, late 1970s, populations began to respond to the management and the science basis of the management. But since then, since about 1981, where the peak population was, Populations that have been in decline, and that's largely because of declining habitat conditions throughout most of their range, declining and changing. The last viable estimate, or complete year estimate for 2022, was just a little more than 163,000 mule deer across their range in eastern Oregon. Mule deer harvest was essentially unregulated clear through the 1800s, and then beginning in the early 1900s, they were legislatively managed harvest laws. The first season was put in place in 1901, and uh, since the 40s, there's been a lot of changes. First deer tag was created in 48. Um, we separated rifle and bow tags in uh, 1979. Limited rifle hunting across all of eastern Oregon for mule deer began in 1991, and 30 years later, we started it for archery hunters in 2021. Um, some other actions that are really important is the Mule Deer Initiative started in 2010, as Brian's already pointed out. It's resulted in hundreds of thousands of acres and actions out on our landscape, and it's going to continue into the future. Um, the harvest we see here peaked in about 1968, but the hunters peaked in 1972 years later. And since then, our harvest opportunity and our success has pretty much mirrored the trend in the population that we saw this slide. First management objective of 317,900 deer was established in 1981. That was, uh, I don't know, 11,000 deer higher than the existing population estimate. Um, populations for the, the population MO is for a wildlife management unit's winter population um, since. 1981, we revised those with the first management plan in 1990. 
again after the second revision or the revision of that plan in 2003 we adjusted them in 2005 and then again in 2016 with a population mo of 343,000 over a population in 2016 of about 220,000 deer the buck ratio mo's those are the number of bucks in a herd we would like to see out there after the hunting season closes. In 1981, those buck ratio MOs range from 7 to 25 per 100 does in the wildlife management units. As we've revised these, revised these MOs, they've slowly crept up in some units, and in the last three revisions of the management objectives, they've ranged from 12 to 25 per wildlife management unit. Jumping over to the herd ranges a little bit, we all know mule deer are primarily distributed um, east of the Cascade Crest. Um, since their establishment in 1958, our, our data and harvest have been managed by those wildlife management units. Um, it's important to recognize that these Wildlife management units are not specific, species specific and they were implemented primarily as a means for ODFW to manage hunters and hunter distribution. They do not necessarily represent the biological needs of mule deer for a mule deer's life cycle. From a keep and track of mule deer population, we tended to count them on the winter ranges across the wildlife management units. We've learned in the last several decades that there is a very poor relationship between the seasonal distributions, and this makes it very difficult for us to develop reliable population estimates. We also know that we've seen differences in wintering populations compared to the summer populations during the hunting seasons, and our harvest data suggests that there's oftentimes many more deer in a, in a unit than what we count in that same unit during the winter. This points to a need for a more biologically meaningful scale. So we decided in 2014 that we would take on trying to define herd ranges or trying to develop those areas that meet the year-round needs of a mule deer herd or a mule deer population. We wanted to define needs and develop these based on the observed seasonal ranges and the, the movements wanted to define those boundaries objectively and develop them so we minimize the interactions between herds, also maintain groupings between the winter and summer distributions of those animals. As Brian pointed out, we embarked on a major coloring effort, one of the largest in the West regarding mule deer. Uh, all of the collars we've deployed to do this were GPS collared picking a point or taking a point between every five and 13 hours. In the effort to define the ranges, we've collared nearly 1,500 animals, and those animals have carried those collars from one to three years, resulting in almost 2,700 deer years, or deer years representing an, one animal's movement from the winter to the spring migration, summer, and back from the fall migration to the winter range. In, in all, we used over 2.1 million point locations of mule deer across the entirety of the Oregon mule deer landscape. It's a pretty significant chunk of data for us to direct what we're doing. The way that we did this is we used what's called a net squared displacement as a movement metric. It's a very interesting piece. We anchor the point of that mule deer's movement and we cut, catch that animal during the winter. You can see in this slide, we caught this animal in the, the winter period and there was very little movement on his winter range, but spring comes around and he migrates a significant distance. It shows up dramatically, spends his, her summer, not much movement, and then migrates back to the winter range in the fall. We see that spatially, um, the collar here moved over to the summer range moved right back in the same footprints to the summer range. The resident animals, they show up dramatically different. Their movements are, appear at least more sporadic and more contained, and they use a significantly smaller area 
throughout the course of the year. It shows up dramatically, spins his herd. So all of these animals that we did to develop our, our herd ranges were providing us some very detailed seasonal information on the animals. Our first step for each individual animal, all 1,500 of them almost, is to calculate a winter and summer seasonal home range. And that's represented by these home ranges here from the first few years worth of data. We took the center point, or the average center X and Y coordinate for each of those home ranges, or the centroid, and we spread those out on the landscape. And for those, we basically take a home range probability distribution of all of those seasonal centroids. These are subsequently used for us to look at the clustering of those centroid home ranges and identify our draft population units, as we can see here. These clearly separate, separate out as a separate group of animals. These are a group of animals. It really shows us how these animals decide to separate themselves out on the winter ranges. The next step is we take those animals and we move them out to the summer ranges. Um, from there, we can use the endpoints of these uh, migration connectors, and we use those to kind of draw our boundary points between the herds as they're keeping themselves in a grouping from winter to summer rain. Some of this does require a little bit of judgment. We're looking for obvious barriers, the probability Home range areas tend to overlap a little bit when you draw those by themselves, but we know that there are barriers that exist on the landscape, such as the, the Chutes River is shown in the figure on the left. And we know that I-84 is a pretty significant barrier for mule deer as depicted over here on the right. We validated those by running our boundaries through the district expertise and our district wildlife biologists out there. We tuned them up a little bit to account for logistic reasons and validation on their observed movements. And then the final validation came using some methodologies called volume of intercept, which basically measures the amount of overlap between the final herd range boundaries. The step of implementing this herd range content, it's going to be used in lots of different places. As we can see on the, the right, our 22 herd ranges overlap all of our Eastern Oregon WMUs. We can see that some of those WMUs are all inside of our single herd range. Other WMUs are split by herd ranges. So as we move forward from here, we're going to implement this herd range as the basis for how we monitor and model our populations. It's going to play a significant role in managing our harvest and monitoring our harvest and it's going to play a significant role from the movements of these animals as we move forward and help direct us in our habitat management and, and prioritization of all of that. I believe with that I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Josh Schmidt to talk a little bit about mule deer biology and ecology. And I think I need to release my screen and allow Josh to take control with his. Thanks, Don. Uh, seeing this? I'm assuming y'all are seeing this. Yeah, I appreciate it, Don, and thanks, Brian, for the introduction. I'm Josh Smith. I'm back to the winter range. currently, like, uh, like Brian said, I'm the acting mule deer coordinator here. And before we jump into this biology and ecology section, I did kind of want to set the tone and and background on, on this chapter, you know, uh, just the last couple of weeks, uh, a new edition of the Ecology Management of Black-tailed Deer and Mule Deer from North America just came out, um, kind of summarizing a lot of that, a lot of the, a lot of uh, pertinent information to, to mule deer and black tails, and that book is about 500 pages long, so our goal with this was not to summarize that entire body of literature related to mule deer biology and ecology, but rather to introduce some key concepts that will be important in these later sections when we do start to address some of these issues in greater detail. And then uh, our second goal was to provide an overview 
uh, also uh, of these coming sections that are going to be important concepts for us to address as it relates to mule deer populations, specifically in Oregon. So I'd like to think about this as more of a, this is more of an abstract of some of those later sections when we'll, we'll, we'll dive into some of these in, in greater detail. And one of those key concepts often gets referred to is, is this idea of carrying capacity or, or K. Um, it is a key concept in, in, in population biology and really in its most simplistic form, it just acknowledges that the availability of resources ultimately determines the number of animals that can be supported for a unit area. And, you know, this is important for, for us to consider when we are when we're managing populations to figure out where we are kind of on this curve because there's a lot of things that happen at different points along this. And you see this graph here um, on your on that left axis um, going going vertical is population and then on the x axis there is time. You can see you see slower population growth when those populations are very low uh, just because we have a limited number of breeders that are available to reproduce. And then you start to see faster growth uh, as you get towards the middle of this curve. And uh, that's when you start to maximize the number of breeders, but before you also start getting uh, some of these density dependence factors that kick in. And when I say density dependence, it means resources start to become limited. Um, you get things like reduced pregnancy rates, increased age of first, um, first pregnancy, we get lower fawn weights, may, may get overwinter, more overwinter uh, mortality. Um, as those as those resources become more limited, and that's what we mean by density dependence effects. <clears throat> so again, you start to see slower growth um, as you as you do start to approach um, carrying capacity. And within this, it is important to, to recognize that carrying capacity is dynamic. This thing changes from year to year, and even can change within years. And examples of this include things like fires, harsh winters, droughts. Those sort of things can alter the landscape and and change. Um, the, the capacity of that area to support mule deer populations. Um, this is kind of a cornerstone of a lot of what we do in fundamental concept of biological processes. So in Eastern Oregon and really across much of mule deer range, uh, mule deer live in highly seasonal and often nutritionally limited environments. And migration is one of the best tactics they use um, to overcome this, and it is used by over half of Oregon's mule deer. It's often that herd range analysis. There, are, there are a lot of uh, animals on in, in Eastern Oregon that do do migrate um, to avoid some of these harsh conditions like heavy snowpack in winter, and take advantage of forage during its most nutritious time. And that's generally in the spring, right when these things start to start to green up. And oftentimes, animals are kind of following at the you know at the trailing tailing edge of that snow melt to get these uh, plants when they are in their most nutritious state. And this is often called surfing the green wave. <clears throat> and it allows, not only does it allow mule deer to take advantage of, of those highly nutritious resources, but it also allows mule deer to reduce interspecific competition, um, you know, between themselves by reducing their densities from winter to summer. Um, we do have a couple issues mule deer face, um, you know, certainly as, as we look at this map and see those different areas, um, there are potential barriers along these routes and, and changing phenological patterns can disrupt some of those and, and really make migration a little less effective. I'll talk a little bit more about those changing phenological patterns later, but you can also just kind of look at the next slide here. Um, and I, I should just really quickly point out that um, this map here and the one from the previous slide uh, is from a recent publication from our department, Migration Matters. Um, I think Don was involved with that as well as Rachel Weed, our connectivity coordinator. Um, these will be available fairly soon. We are, we're going to put these up on our website and, and get those available. So anyone wants to check those out can also read up on these, but there's some really good stuff in there. <clears throat> but on this map specifically, if you kind of kind of look at those darker areas, these are just kind of showing some of the roads, uh, major roads and highways here in Eastern Oregon. But those darker areas, those purple purplish areas, represent areas where anywhere from 201 to 682 deer vehicle collisions occurred over a five mile stretch of highway from 2010 to 2021. And then those lighter colors just kind of kind of go down, but even even 
you know, they go anywhere from 101 to 200 on the, on the next lighter color, I'll go all the way down to approximately one vehicle collision in those lightest colors you see there. So, you know, our roads and highways are obviously can be a direct source of mortality, but they also do represent some pretty significant barriers to animal movements and these migration routes. And, you know, as Don pointed out, like that section up there in Long Highway Interstate 81, uh, up near La Grande in northeastern Oregon, uh, that was really uh, nearly a complete barrier. We didn't really see any animals successfully navigate that stretch of highway and, and come across. So these scenes can be a really uh, detrimental to, to animal movements and cut off some of those migration routes. And when, when we do think about deer migration, um, it, is, it is important to point out that mule deer are really, have really high site fidelity to both their winter, summer, and migratory routes. And what I mean by high site fidelity is they really like to go back to those same areas year in and year out. Um, and then when these animals are cut off, um, we can get what, what a lot of people, some people have started calling like vacant space, just areas that mule deer are not occupying where they traditionally did because these migratory routes have been cut off. And it can take mule deer several generations to potentially fill those places back in once that does occur. Um, we do have several diseases here in Oregon that we kind of watch and are, are kind of worried about and can have some, some effects on our, our, our mule deer populations. Uh, we have a few hemorrhagic diseases. These include EHD or epizootic hemorrhagic disease and AHD, adenovirus hemorrhagic disease. Um, as well as blue tongue. Um, these diseases, though, tend to usually be cyclic and, and fairly localized. They, they don't tend to really affect, have population-wide um, um, impacts. But again, they can be fairly harsh locally. They also tend to affect white-tailed deer more often uh, than they do mule deer, and seems to be a, a little rougher on them as well. Um, hair loss syndrome is another Kind of common disease. I, I, I feel like I see that mostly in town deer for whatever reason. So it, it is kind of a highly highly visible disease. Uh, you know, again, because because these animals are in, in areas where people can see them. Uh, and you know, with that, you can get things like uh, overwinter mortality um, as they they just can't uh, keep themselves warm and, and die. But these, these can have again kind of more local impacts. Um, but when we think about diseases that could potentially have population level effects and probably the biggest one for, for mule deer and a lot of a lot of ungulate species across the West in, in general is, is chronic wasting disease or CWD. Um, this disease is a, a it, it's a prion disease. Um, it is 100% fecal. Um, form encephalopathy basically it just turns uh, ungulate brains into uh, sponges. So, um, I mean, it just eats holes in them. So, it is, uh, again, it's, it's always, it's 100% fatal, and it is something that's really nasty once it gets in the environment. And, you know, as of, as of this year and as of right now, we have not detected CWD in Oregon, but we are, you know, kind of prepared for this and kind of looking, or, or at least preparing for the initial uh, chance that it does come into the state. One of those reasons is because, um, uh, it has been found very close to the Oregon border. Uh, this map here shows all the sampling that's been taking place in Idaho, and those darker areas there just represent areas with greater samples, and the lighter areas are just fewer fewer samples. But that red area is uh, uh, one of their units where they did find positive CWD-infected animals just a few miles from the Snake River there uh, up in northeastern Oregon. Um, and we know the Snake River is not a boundary. We get animals crossing that routinely, so we could get some natural integration uh, some, from some of these infected populations into Oregon. Um, we are stepping up our CWD surveillance. If it gets here, I will say management will change. Um, we are, we will be integrating our CWD management plan into our current mule deer plan and talk about those uh, as we, we move on in, into that disease chapter. We'll be talking a lot more about this. Um, and then if I could just kind of maybe get on my soapbox here for one minute, though, one of the other ways that CWD is probably likely to get here in Oregon is through the transport of infected carcasses. Surveillance, it could be hunters harvesting an animal in an area infected with CWD and then bringing potentially brain matter or spinal tissue 
back in. And, and again, this thing is, is really nasty. It's really detrimental. Uh, you just can't hardly, it can stay in the soil. It can get in plants. So it's, it's just really a, a nasty thing. So uh, a couple things on this. Uh, if you if you do see these check stations, it is mandatory to stop if you're transporting wildlife to stop at these check stations. And uh, if you harvest a deer or other ungulate outside of Oregon, don't bring home parts of the animal known to harbor the disease. And again, namely, that's the brain and spinal columns. Uh, this is illegal. It is okay to bring back packaged meat, uh, clean skulls, clean antlers. Uh, you can bring those things back. Please uh don't bring back whole carcasses or, or, or stuff with brain or spine matter in it. One of the other topics I want to, want to talk about both legal and illegal harvest. These can certainly have population level effects. We get some comments on, on especially the legal harvest sometimes, but uh, as, as far as the legal harvest is concerned here in Oregon, we predominantly have a male dominated harvest for mule deer. And the old saying is bucks don't have babies. Um, and with, you know, Don showed those buck MOs. Um, we, we range anywhere from 12 to 25 uh, MOs, uh, buck MOs, meaning number of, of males per 100 females. Uh, we have, it's very unlikely that legal harvest is going to have any population level effects. And in fact, a study from Colorado um, on mule deer really showed there was no difference in reproduction uh, as far as pregnancy rates, reproduction, or timing of parturition in populations that had high males per 100 females, and that's about 26 per 100, versus those that had lower 14 males per 100 females. So really they got found no, no evidence that uh, those there was any difference in, in reproductive output uh, based on those uh, bug numbers. Um, illegal harvest is, is something else entirely, uh, illegal killing or poaching. Um, if, it is, if it is conducted on mainly the male segment, it, it, again, unlikely to have population level effects, but it does reduce opportunity and takes away tags that would have been available for obviously, uh, you know, law abiding hunters and, and citizens of, of Oregon to do to abide by law. Um, However, with that segment, you know, if we do see a lot of illegal harvest, this can have more, more population level effects. Um, in fact, uh, you know, from 2005 to 2013, a study in southeastern Oregon documented 11% of our adult female mortality was from illegal harvest. So pretty high numbers down there um, several years back anyway. Um, in Oregon, we do have a full suite of predators occupying most of our mule deer range. Um, while all of these predators can uh, and do kill and consume mule deer, uh, cougars tend to be the primary source of adult mortality here in Oregon and, and really across their range. Wolves also take adult mule deer, um, although where they are concurrent with elk, elk does tend to be the primary prey source um, or wolves, although again they, they do take they do take adults here. Most of our mule um, range. Um, looking at bobcats and bears and, and to to some extent coyotes, um, these things are primarily at least the bobcats and bears. They primarily will take uh, those very young uh, newborn fawns during those first few weeks of life, kind of when they're in the higher phase. That's when when bears especially tend to be able to to come across them. Um, do start seeing a, a little bit of mortality as they start to move around. But for the most part, once those things, after the first few weeks of life, uh, the mortality rate from, from bobcats and bears, and even to a lesser extent coyotes, tends to decline pretty rapidly. Um, coyotes will tend, they, they can and do take adults as well as those young of the year. Um, that tends to happen uh, at the end of winter, early spring, when animals are really nutritionally stressed, and also when we tend to get that, you know, uh, hard coat of ice uh, starts to starts to crust up. They can run across it, deer punch through, and again, it can uh, they they can take adult deer, especially during that time. Um, a couple things on predation. You know, it, it is important to think about um, when we talk about predation rate sometimes it's important to consider the overall survival rate of those animals and, and you know not just think about uh, um, don't take the rate of, of 
of the mortality source, if 90% of mortalities was, was predation, it's also important to look at overall survival. And, you know, one of the other things, if, if start to think about additive versus compensatory mortality on, on, on these things, if predation is compensatory, uh, those animals would have died from other causes anyway. Um, so, you know, for instance, overwinter mortality, and, and if predation is additive, those animals would have survived um, that year. So it's always important to figure out where you are on that continuum, and a lot of times predation is not 100% additive or 100% compensatory. Uh, lies somewhere in the middle there in, on a continuum. Um, summer range is extremely important for mule deer. Um, it, it does tend to be a higher elevation that provides um, ample forage um, as well as hiding cover for bonding periods. And I think for years there was probably a greater emphasis on winter range as that was where the biggest proportion of mortalities does occur. But there's been a lot of research recently highlighting how important summer range is to prepare mule deer for those times of reduced forage availability and heard this compared mule deer, someone compared mule deer to, to uh, bears, um, you know, in, in their, their life cycle. They don't exactly hibernate, but again, if they don't come into winter in pretty good shape, they're, they're kind of in trouble and can be more susceptible to overwinter mortality. And if you look at this figure here at the top, um, top left there, that is an area with high canopy cover, <clears throat> very little light, able to penetrate the ground. This results in reduced growth of a lot of the forbs and shrubs that mule deer need to consume, especially during those, those high energy requirement periods, such as when they are lactating, when, when demands can be anywhere from four to seven times higher than, than base demands, and anywhere from two to three times higher um, than during gestation. And you know, if you look at that, that other graph kind of shows some light penetrating, you're getting more light, you're getting more of those shrubs, there's a bit of treated area there. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of our, our summer range targeting is on federal lands and changing land use practices such as reduced logging, altered fire regimes, and that sort of thing have altered the landscape in the last several decades. And this slide here kind of illustrates some of the importance of, uh, of summer range and, and, and why that is important as deer come into winter. This is uh, some preliminary data from the first year of a five-year research project. This is down in the Murderers Creek, Herb Range area, Murderers Creek Wildlife Management Unit area, just uh, kind of south of John Day, John Day River down there. Uh, and again, this is from the first year. This is December of last year. Uh, we are, as we capture these deer, we are, are taking body score metrics using ultrasound to actually measure a lot of, a lot of different uh, thicknesses of uh, the fat content on these animals. And, and first year of this study um, found average body fat score on these animals was, was, was average 10.1%. It ranged from 4.9 uh, to 17.6%. Uh, um, but research uh, that Kevin Monteith has conducted, he's a professor, pretty well known in, in Mule deer research um, out of the University of Wyoming has indicated we need about 12.5% body fat for these animals coming into winter uh, for stable or increasing populations. And only 21%, so 10 out of 47 of the deer we, we measured this winter, uh, exceeded that 12.5% uh, metric. And then this, this figure on the right just kind of shows the spatial locations of those deer we captured. and. Um, those bigger circles represent deer that had more rump fat uh, on them than, than others. But I will point out that, that that rump fat is not total body fat. That is just one of the metrics we use to get total body fat. So there's several different metrics, but that is one. So that the key point is those bigger circles represent deer that were in better shape on that, on that figure to the right there. Um, we do have a second study site planned um, to hopefully be implemented as well down in the kind of the claim of Falls area. Uh, hope we get that up and running this year as well. Um, this study will be looking at the, both the effects of nutrition and predation on mule deer. We will be estimating predator densities, uh, again, as well as body condition of mule deer coming into and leaving winter and tying both of these into overall population performance. So we will be looking at the predation side of things as well in this study. Winter 
Braves also, you know, obviously very important uh, for mule deer as well. These areas tend to be at lower elevations that provide, you know, a little bit of forage and, and hopefully some thermal cover and relatively less snow. Um, on these winter ranges, mule deer body condition generally will decline throughout the winter. Even the best conditions, uh, deer have a, a metabolism that just won't allow them hardly to, to put on weight throughout the winter. Uh, the best you can do is kind of hope, slow, slow the, the, the loss of, of that, the, the fat content on these animals. It is limited on many landscapes, and because it is at lower elevations, it tends to be along rivers and things like that, where water is, um, it is uh, a place where human development uh, often occurs. And because of that, it really is susceptible to, um, you know, a lot of disturbance and fragmentation. Uh, think urban development, houses going in, strip malls, uh, bend area, prime blue area, that sort of thing. Uh, and then another one, kind of on our radar right now is uh, solar farms. Uh, you know, as, as we try to diversify our energy grid and start get to get more energy from renewable sources, uh, this is going to be a, a big impact and potentially a, a source of something we're going to have to continue to look at. And, you know, right now, the, I will say the literature is pretty sparse on uh, impacts from solar farms and, and best management practices to mitigate some of the some of the detrimental effects from this on on, on real deer and, and some other wildlife. So we're actively looking at some ways to increase our, our knowledge of this. And in fact, uh, you know, solar farm research uh, and, and mitigating those impacts is one of the top priorities as identified by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, the Mule Deer Working Group. It is the top area of research. Um, and, you know, it's really important as we, we think about these things going in that we work with, uh, you know, a lot of our other agencies and, and planning uh, planning zones and, and cities and stuff to properly site these solar farms to reduce those impacts uh, to uh, to our mule deer habitat. And again, a lot of times when these go in, they are really fenced, so they can be you know kind of really uh, exclude animals from coming in there. At least your ungulates and 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 can also act as barriers to migration routes as well. And then kind of lastly on this, and this is not just for, for winter range, but also for summer range as well. Um, invasive species are a huge deal, huge issue. A lot of these plants are un, unpalatable for mule deer, mule deer and other ungulate species, and once these things come in, they can they can be pretty nasty and, and, and difficult to remove and, and get rid of over the long term. So this slide here, kind of talking about some results that we found um, Kind of comparing some data from 2015 to 2000, uh, sorry, from 1990s to 2015 to 2019. This is from a paper that just came out in, in 2021 here from our East Side Research Office. But really, what we found is, you know, temperatures it's gotten warmer and drier over that intervening 30 years, essentially, and how this is ultimately impacting uh, the habitat and, and forage quality for mule deer. Um, so these last two last two points down here, um, we did find from that study that the duration of green up, so for our grasses and forbs, so that time when those those plants are the most nutritious, most palatable, most easily digestible time period for mule deer, and also at critical times that are coming out of winter, was two to three weeks shorter than compared to the 1990s average. So we're losing about two to three weeks of our growing season on the front end, or at least the time when these plants are most nutritious anyway. And then on the back end, kind of going in towards the tail end of summer, um, plants are senescing, and by that I mean they were just drying up, becoming unpalatable. There's not much nutritional value once those things do tend to brown, brown up and, and, and really start to dry out. Um, those, those were 25 days earlier uh, than they were in the 1990s. So really we've seen it on both ends, the early spring and late summer, uh, these plants are, so again, that growing season has kind of compressed, losing about a month of the growing season. And kind of taking this back and, and thinking about this in terms of carrying capacity and what this may mean for our landscape, you know, if, if, if these similar trends, and, and this is what the data seems to say, um, we could have seen carrying capacity here in the 1970s, and, and that, that carrying capacity and the ability of these uh, landscapes to hold mule deer has just slowly declined those intervening 
intervening decades. And again, kind of how all this stuff ultimately impacts populations. Uh, you know, as we as we do start to see degraded habitat, lower nutritional quality, and, and poor nutrition in our adult mule deer, you know, we do start to see things like lower reproduction, lower bond survival. We get uh, reduction in the number of twins. We can go from 1.8 to 1.5 bonds per doe, for instance, and we get lower bond survival rates. They're born lighter and, and uh, birth weight and, and coming into winter weight is a, a key factor that determines bond over winter survival. We can also have lower adult survival, and this can increase their risk to things like um, disease uh, and also increase their uh, risk to predation rates. And this is from not only the adults, but also the fawns as well. Again, kind of thinking about this as, as our summer range, if, it, if it's degraded and these things aren't in great condition, uh, you know, if they're, these fawns are in, not getting fed as often or if mom is not lactating as much, maybe they're calling more and uh, that and this could make them more, more susceptible to predation. And, you know, ultimately all these things interact to uh, lower population performance and reduce population growth. Um, so, you know, again, I just want to kind of circle back to what I kind of mentioned at the first of this talk here. Um, our goal is not to summarize the entire body of literature on mule deer, but to really hit kind of hit some high points and talk about some of these issues that we think are important for mule deer and things that we're going to be addressing in some later chapters. So, uh, really just want to really leave it with that as far as that, but also kind of as we kind of move ahead and think about some current issues, um, you know, Don mentioned the herd range analysis. As we transition to herd ranges, some of the current issues we are working to address include aligning our harvest management, management objectives and data collection um, to this new scale. And we want to provide more updates on this process uh, in coming months and kind of talk about those. Those will be action items in, in future chapters. So kind of thinking of our next steps here, um, this next chapter, will be uh, our mule deer management concepts and issues. This really is going to be the heart of the plan and where we start digging into more org specific details. And again, I kind of, we kind of outlined, you know, we started talking about predation and, and nutrition and summer range and winter range. Uh, in this next section, we are going to get into those in more detail and, and really highlight, um, uh, really get into the weeds on some of those issues. And in addition to that, we are, our goal with this is to include action items. So talk about things that we as an agency plan to do, how we plan to address, you know, reaching out to federal partners on, on, on summer range, what we plan to do on predation issues and, and uh, CWD and, and some of these important topics that we, we talked about here uh, in this section. And, and so kind of looking ahead here to the relative near-term future, um, Don mentioned we kind of have a tentative plan to have a June webinar, and that would cover uh, the next four or five chapters that we plan on, on releasing migration and habitat fragmentation, climate change, fire impacts, nutrition, and economics, and social value. And I know Brian has said it, Don said it, I'll say it again, we want your input. Um, these chapters that, being, that are being released are, in fact, draft chapters. Um, we welcome your comments and recommendations. Um, once, we, once we get these, we will revise based on public feedback and, again, hopefully have a full, full draft compiled by late fall and uh, adoption in early 2024. Uh, we are also changing up the website. We'll be adding additional meal deer related content, such as that Migration Matters publication. It'll be coming soon. Uh, and we hope to get some more stuff up there and, and kind of revamp this and, and put up uh, by a little bit more clarity on, on, on the process and how we plan on doing this uh, directly on the website here moving forward. But for those that are potentially watching this that haven't already done so, please go to the website and sign up for email alerts. Um, again, stay engaged. We want, we want you all to be involved in this process and we are reading comments as they come in and these will direct, um, you know, how we address some of these issues. Um, and with that, I think maybe we have some time to take a few 
questions? Yeah, I don't know that we can take them, but we can address them. Well, address them. Yeah, we've, we've got a number of questions so far. Um, a number, number of you folks are doing a pretty good job of providing us some uh, suggestions and comments. One consistency we've already found is that there's a number of folks that have submitted some comments asking questions about the process and expressing desires to see an entire complete document. We understand that. That's what we're all used to doing. But as pointed out early on, we're hoping that this new process gives you folks as reviewers and us as authors um, more time to really critically think our way through all of these various steps in our process. Um, the final results that we're going to get out there are going to address a whole suite of issues. They're going to be very helpful in um, addressing planning processes, energy development processes, um, harvest management processes. We're incorporating our internal local expertise to help us with the um, drafting of the language for the development issues. We've got our local energy coordinator helping us with how we describe and develop our action items for energy siting. Uh, all of this is going to play a role into uh, county planning. Uh, we've already seen some of our information from all of our coloring e efforts being incorporated into the discussions for the Schutz County in their rewrite of their goal five areas. Um, the plan at self will not at this point redefine those goal five areas but the information used to development is going to be part and partial and critical to many of those decision processes um i know nobody's surprised but we're getting a consistent thread from a number of comments uh expressing concerns over and and desires for uh predator control uh we understand that we also are concerned in many areas about uh, the effects that predation can have on mule deer. We're also seeing that it might be um, an interaction with other factors that are occurring on the landscape, as Josh has just described for us. Um, we will be uh, putting a great deal of detail into the predation and predation management as it affects mule deer populations when that section comes out this summer. Um, we are going to put our brains together and, and see what we can do from additional potential management actions that might be possible, even though we've been working fairly hard for over three decades trying to find those creative ways to manage um, predation. Um, maybe I'll let Josh take a few here and, and see, go from there, and I'll regroup. Sure, Don. Um yeah, I guess, you know, one other kind of thing we've had, we've had a couple of people mention like hunting tags. Uh, why don't we reduce hunting tags to increase populations or even halt hunting in some areas uh, to let these populations grow? Uh, Try to address some of that in the talk. Uh, but again, in Oregon, we do have a, a primarily a male dominated harvest. These factors don't. Uh, you, you have to get down to pretty low buck to female ratios where you're not getting all your females bred um, and, and you start seeing lower reproduction rates. And again, that just d doesn't seem to be the case uh, potential for us here, given the, the buck MOs and the, the bucks per does that we have here in Oregon right now. Um, you know, I mentioned, mentioned one study there from Colorado that found, you know, no difference in, in some of those metrics between high and low pregnancies. And, and in fact, another study from kind of that same area found that actually when they increased their buck EMOs too high, they actually saw a reduction in fawn to doe ratios. They actually saw the, the opposite impact of what they were wanting. And they concluded that rate, uh, reducing buck harvest should just be used as a tool to increase uh, the amount of and number of bucks, um, you know, prime age bucks and, and larger bucks, but not as a, uh, population increasing tool um, for those for those areas um, so again that's something seems to be a, a, a little bit of a misunderstanding sometimes on on that um, you know another question we've 
got kind of related to, you know, what can we plant, help grow, maintain a sustainable food source for mule deer? Um, I don't know that I want to say that we are, we're going to be able to plant our way out of this. A lot of these species are on the landscape. They're just not able to grow and getting out competed. Um, if conditions were turned around, uh, again, such as, you know, thinning some of these areas, um, you know, some fire regimes that come through, uh, those would improve uh, the quality and quantity of some of those species that are available um, on the landscape. Some of the things that we're obviously working on, Don and Brian, I think both mentioned the mule deer initiative. That's been one of the ways that we put money into improving habitat and have done a lot of things, uh, and, you know, removing invasive species, taking down fences that can be a uh, direct source of mortality. Uh, so we've, we've done a lot of work there. But as we think about what makes good mule deer habitat, we need a mosaic of habitats. There need to be some differences in, in, in space and time. Uh, you know, even, even when you do treat these areas with either a burn or a fire, you're getting about 15 to 20 years of, 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 of use out of that before it kind of reverts back to where it was before. So this is a long-term commitment. You can't just treat an area and then walk away. It is, it is going to be a long-term commitment for us um, as an agency and, and working with our federal partners. And kind of on that, as we, you know, as we try to engage with our, our federal partners, especially to improve summer range, summer habitat, um, we need you, the public, to be involved and, 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 you know, reach out to them when they are having their planning processes and, and stay engaged and say this is something you would like to see. So uh, try and stay involved and stay engaged on that front. You can definitely help mule deer and, and, and increase mule deer habitat uh, by doing that. Good, Josh. Um, maybe I'll just take one more shot at it because we are running up against some time issues here. I mean, we did receive a comment earlier or a, an an email full of comments earlier today, uh, quite a bit in there. Um, but what I want to address is the way that we're doing the plan, it's going to address all kinds of stuff. We've already pointed out that management objectives, for one, this plan is going to provide us, we're going to develop a process and the sideboards for how we change the scale of those management objectives. It's going to take us a little while to get there, but we're, we're going to come up and develop a viable process for getting there. Um, there's been some questions asked about how other parts of other things the agency is doing, how those are going to play into from a meal deer standpoint. Uh, several folks have asked about the migration stuff. You betcha that information is going to play into all of the appropriate areas from a habitat management or uh, connectivity issues, the priority wildlife connectivity areas, the cross instructor discussions, all of this information from this massive um, coloring effort we've done, it's providing useful information everywhere we turn around. 